Alright, you guys, if you guys could please turn to Unit 2, Reasoning and Proofs, or Reasoning and Proof, I'll start you guys out with some definitions. Alright, let's take a look at some of these. I'm going to actually start with conjecture. A conjecture is an unproven statement that is based on observations, so kind of like an educated guess based on things that you've observed. Inductive reasoning is when you find a pattern in specific cases and then write a conjecture for the general, for the general case. So for example, two, four, six, obviously there's a pattern going. You would probably guess that the next number is going to be eight. Okay? Or if I said, hmm, oh, what happened here? Here we go. Or if I said, um, Miss Rodriguez is a teacher and she's female and Miss Z is a teacher and she's female and Miss Tennyson is a teacher and she's female. Oh, all teachers must be female. Okay, that would be a conjecture based on st something that I observed, but it would be an incorrect thing. So inductive reasoning is not always correct. Deductive reasoning um, uses facts, definitions, accepted properties, the laws of logic, um, all of these things to form a logical argument, okay? This is different from inductive reasoning, which uses specific examples and patterns to form a, form a conjecture. Deductive reasoning has to be true. Your, the, the conclusion you come to is going to be is going to be accurate. So for example, x plus 2 equals 4, obviously in this case x has to equal 2. We're not guessing there. Based on this information, this has to be, this is the conclusion that you have to draw, okay? A counterexample is a specific case for which a conjecture is false. So like I said earlier, if I, I said all teachers are female, well you'd say, well Mr. Shrip is not female and he's a teacher. That would be a counterexample. I just proved that conjecture false with, it, with uh, a specific case. All right. A conditional statement is a logical statement that has two parts. Ah. A hypothesis and a conclusion. Okay? When a conditional statement is written in if-then form, kind of like this one down here, the if part contains the hypothesis and the then part contains the conclusion. So here's an example. If angles are a linear pair, that's the hypothesis, then they are supplementary. That's the conclusion. All right? The converse, to write the converse of a conditional statement, you basically just exchange the hypothesis and the conclusion. So the converse of this statement would be, if angles are supplementary, then they are a linear pair. Okay? To write the inverse, you negate both the hypothesis and the conclusion, okay? The negation of a statement is the opposite of the original statement. So in this case, it would be if angles are not a linear pair, then they are not supplementary, okay? Um, to write the contrapositive, you first write the converse and then you negate both the, it, it's basically, the inverse of the converse. So this is P implies Q, this is Q implies P, this is not P implies not Q, and this is not Q implies not P. So the contrapositive of this would be if angles are not supplementary, then they are not a linear pair. Okay? A biconditional includes the phrase if and only if. Okay? So um, let me talk about equivalent statements and I'll come back to biconditional. Um, a conditional statement and its contrapositive are either both true or both false. Okay? So, for example, in this case, if angles are a linear pair, then they're supplementary. If angles are not supplementary, then they are not a linear pair. Both of those statements are true. Okay? Likewise, 
the converse and inverse of a conditional statement are either both true or both false. In this case, if angles are supplementary, then they are a linear pair. That's not true. If angles are not a linear pair, then they are not supplementary. That's not true either. Okay? Pairs of statements such as these are called equivalent statements. Um, it, basically, any time both these statements have to be either both true or both false, they're called equivalent statements. Okay? When a conditional statement and its converse are both true, then you can write them as a single biconditional statement. So let's imagine for a moment that the, the conditional and the converse were both true. Basically, all four of these statements here were true. Okay? You could write this as angles are a linear pair if and only if they are supplementary. IFF is my abbreviation for if and only if. Okay, so if the conditional and the converse are both true, you can write that like that. Um, any valid definition can be written as a biconditional statement. All right, the law of syllogism and the law of detachment. The law of syllogism states that if P implies Q and Q implies R, then P implies R. So for example, if X equals 5, then 2X equals 10. And if 2x equals 10, then 2x plus 3 equals 13. The conclusion that you would draw from the law of syllogism would be if x equals 5, then 2x plus 3 equals 13. So it's the first part and the last part. You just eliminate the part in the middle. The law of detachment states that if p implies q is true and p is true, then q is also true. So for example, if segments are equal, then they are congruent. Oh, AB equals CD. What's the conclusion that you draw? If the segments are equal, then the segments have to be congruent. Okay? All right. Um, these properties down here, you should remember from algebra. So I'm just going to write them down and have you copy them so you have them in your notes. All right. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division properties. Basically, um, you can add, subtract, multiply, or divide the same thing from both sides of the equal sign. Okay, you guys did that all last year in algebra, so I'm sure you guys are fine with that. Um, substitution property, if A equals B, then A can be substituted. Substituted means, like, replaced for B in any equation or expression. Distributive property, hopefully you guys are familiar with that. These might be a little bit new. Um, reflexive property, symmetric property, and transitive property. I've given you two versions of each property, one with segments and one with angles. Reflexive property is basically stating that anything equals itself. So segment AB is congruent to segment AB. Angle A is congruent to angle A. Symmetric property if segment AB is congruent to segment CD, then you can flip them around. Then uh, segment CD is congruent to segment AB. Likewise, if angle A is congruent to angle B, then angle B is congruent to angle A. Transitive property. If segment AB is congruent to segment CD and segment CD is congruent to segment EF, then segment AB has to be congruent to segment EF. And the same thing with angles. If angle A is congruent to angle B, and angle B is congruent to angle C, then angle A has to be congruent to angle C. All right, last row. All right, right angles congruence theorem. This theorem states that all right angles are congruent. Seems pretty obvious, but there's actually a theorem that says it. The congruence supplements theorem says that if, basically, if two angles are supplementary to the same angle, then those two angles are congruent. So in this diagram, if angles 1 and 2 are supplementary, and angles 3 and 2 are supplementary, then angle 1 has to be congruent to angle 3, which makes sense if you think about it. So, like, imagine, let's imagine that angle 2 was 120 degrees. Then in order for angle 1 to be supplementary to it, angle 1 would have to be 60 degrees because 60 plus 120 is 180. 
But if angle 2 is 120 and angle 3 is also supplementary to angle 2, then angle 3 has to be 60 degrees because those would add up to 180. But that would mean that angle 1 is 60 degrees and angle 3 is 60 degrees, which, which makes them, them congruent. Well, that, that, that works for any number you pick for angle 2. The same thing for complementary angles. If angle 1 and angle 2 are complementary and angle 3 and angle 2 are complementary, then angle 1 has to be congruent to angle 3. Alright, and that's it for Unit 2.